In late July or early August of 36 BC, Caesar D.V. Filius launched his second coordinated attack against Sextus Pompeius, the boat king whose occupation of Sicily had blocked grain shipments to the suffering people of Italia. Although he previously failed to take Sicily from Pompeius in his pincer attack of 38 BC, Caesar now looked to a three-pronged strategy conceived by his right-hand man, the 37 BC consul Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, for a better outcome. Also to his benefit were the 120 ships given to Caesar by his fellow triumvir and brother-in-law, Marcus Antonius, which remained stationed at Tarentum. This fleet, commanded by another 37 BC consul, Titus Statilius Taurus, consisted of approximately 21 legions, 20,000 cavalry, and 5,000 light infantry. From Africa, Triumvir Marcus Aemilius Lepidus joined the invasion effort, launching 70 warships which carried approximately 12 legions. And from Puteoli, roughly 300 brand new warships, secretly constructed within the hidden port complex comprising Lakes Arvernus and Lucrinus, now launched onto the seas. Powered by 20,000 slaves would be manumitted and trained as oarsmen, these novel warships, designed by Agrippa, were larger than the average warship, were able to carry more legions, and were equipped with the latest military technology, the Harpax. Created by Agrippa himself, the Harpax was a counterpart to the Corvus boarding bridge, which was standard equipment on most Roman warships. The Harpax was an iron claw which was attached to ropes that were protected by iron bands. Launched from a ballista, the claw sunk its teeth into opposing vessels which passed within range, preventing their escape. The iron rings protected the claw from being cut loose as the Harpax reeled in its prey via a mechanical winching device, allowing the enemy vessel to be boarded by the legions. From Puteoli's Bay, this new fleet set sail for Stromboli Island under the joint command of Caesar and Agrippa, intending to engage the attention of Sextus Pompeius. As soon as Caesar's scouts could assure him that the majority of Pompeius's fleet were firmly positioned on Sicily's western coast, Caesar was free to turn over sole command of the naval campaign to Agrippa and quickly sail for Italy. After reaching Tarentum, Caesar then proceeded with the second fleet under the command of Taurus and destined for Teominium, modern-day Teomina, on Sicily's eastern coast. In landing forces at Teominium, Caesar's mission was to isolate Messina, the very city Sextus Pompeius utilized as his base of operations. After Caesar departed Stromboli Island, Agrippa turned his fleet west and sailed to the island of Hera, modern-day Maritimo, a location left undefended by Pompeius. Leaving half his fleet at Hera, Agrippa then sailed eastward along Sicily's coast, where he might attack the fleet of Papias, one of Pompeius's admirals. From Sicily's coast, Sextus Pompeius spied the approaching fleet of Agrippa and rebounded by directing the majority of his own warships to rush to the support of Papias. On August 11 of the 36 BC year, Agrippa's cutting-edge new warships clashed with the smaller but more maneuverable ships under the command of Papias. Realizing that Pompeius's naval fleet was larger than what had been reported by the scouts, Agrippa quickly sent for the other half of his fleet stationed at Hera. At what is known as the Battle of Milae, Papias rallied his fleet to outmaneuver the larger ships of Agrippa, deftly isolating them so that the vessels could be hobbled by destroying their rudders. But the fleet of Sextus Pompeius had not come prepared for Agrippa's secret weapon. When the iron claws of the Harpax grabbed a hold of the Pompeian ships, the legions who were aboard had no mounted scythes capable of cutting through the iron bands that protected the ropes, and thus were helpless to prevent themselves from being dragged alongside their attackers. Between those ships reeled in by the Harpax and those outright rammed by the larger and more sturdy vessels belonging to Agrippa, Papias lost approximately 30 warships during the Battle of Milae, including his own flagship, from which he leapt overboard before swimming to a nearby Pompeian ship. Sextus Pompeius, witnessing the loss of those 30 ships and watching as half of Agrippa's fleet arrived from Hiera, commanded his admiral Papias to begin a retreat. 
Papias ordered the remainder of his ships to sail into the coastal waters and estuaries along Sicily's western coast, where the water was too shallow for Agrippa's larger ships to sail. Joining his now reorganized fleet, Pompeius, with plans of heading to Greece, voyaged through the Messina Straits, where his fleet surprised the oncoming fleet of Titus Tertullius Taurus and Caesar D.V. Filius. Immediately, a second naval battle ensued in which Sextus Pompeius destroyed approximately sixty ships belonging to Caesar, who barely escaped with his life and was forced to swim ashore. Yet, despite the apparent naval loss, several of Caesar's ships, under the command of Cornificius, had successfully landed a total of three legions at Teominium, but they were not the first of the invading forces to arrive in Sicily. During the course of the organized maneuvers of Agrippa and Caesar, which effectively sidetracked Pompeius, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus had likewise succeeded in landing forces at Lilibaeum on Sicily's western shore. Laying siege to Lilibaeum, which was defended by Lucius Rufius Penius, Lepidus also secured several of the surrounding towns. When it became clear that Lilibaeum would fall to Lepidus, who had requisitioned additional troops from Africa, Plinius withdrew and marched his forces to Messina in order to regroup with Sextus Pompeius. Lepidus pursued, sweeping across Sicily with approximately fourteen legions, accepting the surrenders of one town after another. By the time Cornificius landed his three legions at Teominium and turned his attention toward Messina, wherein Plinius and his forces were preparing to be invested, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus had already arrived at the head of his fourteen legions and by the time Agrippa landed his legions on Sicily, Messina was already surrounded. Lucius Rufius Penius, who had been abandoned by the evacuation of Sextus Pompeius, made the decision to offer terms of surrender. However, Marcus Agrippa and Cornificius felt it advisable to await the arrival of Caesar, who was making his way from Italy, before negotiating any terms of surrender with the enemy. But Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, a member of the triumvirate, despite appearances to the contrary, was not subordinate to the D.V. Filius, and as his political equal, refused to wait. Ignoring Agrippa and Cornificius, Lepidus negotiated the surrender of Messina and formally entered the city, whereupon his legions began plundering temples and terrorizing the citizens, so that they might be swayed toward defecting into the ranks of his already fourteen legion army. Marcus Aemilius Lepidus invited the surrendered legions under Penius to share in the plunder and sacking of Messina. By the time Caesar arrived to join Agrippa and Cornificius, Lepidus was in full command of Messina and now laid claim to Sicily as justly his, by right of conquest. Not only had he been the first to land his legions, but it was to Lepidus that the enemy had surrendered, not just in Messina, but all across Sicily. As outraged as Caesar likely was over the outright betrayal of his fellow triumvir, it should be noted that Lepidus only followed the examples previously set by Caesar D. V. Filius and Marcus Antonius following the battles of Philippi, when they enlisted the vast majority of enemy legions and chose to redistribute Rome's provinces. Lepidus, the third partner in the triumvirate, had not even been invited to take part in those negotiations. As a result of his being completely shut out by Caesar and Antonius, his territory was reduced to the lesser province of Africa, while the lion's share of the Roman Empire was distributed between the two strongest triumvirs. But now it was Lepidus who held the strongest position, and Lepidus who had learned well the lesson of perfidy from his fellow triumvirs. As negotiations continued between the two triumvirs, Lepidus offered to return Sicily to Caesar D. V. Filius in exchange for the two Hispanias and Gaul, the territories that had been legally assigned to Lepidus by the Lex Titia of 43 BC, as ratified by the Senate. However, having learned by experience the strategic significance of controlling Sicily, Caesar D. V. Filius knew he could not afford to give Marcus Aemilius Lepidus control of Hispania and Gaul which would make him commander of the preponderance of Rome's legions. Caesar refused Lepidus's proposal. Positioning a host of cavalry at the gates, Caesar then entered the camp of Lepidus with a small escort. Moving among the soldiers, Caesar spoke to them, trying to ascertain their true feelings. 
Not only did Caesar learn that Lepidus' men had no more interest in engaging in civil war than had the legions at Brundisium, but he also learned that the men were angry that they had been forced to share their plunder and booty with Pompeian legions who had only just been under the command of Penius. Before long, many of the soldiers began to defect from Lepidus, following Caesar, who had seized one of Lepidus' eagle standards. As more and more men began to follow Caesar, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus ordered his men to intervene. Soon, fighting broke out as half of the army of Lepidus tried to prevent the other half from defecting to Caesar, who was pierced by a spear during the struggle. The last to defect to Caesar among the legions of Lepidus were the cavalry. Hoping to appease Caesar and curry his favor after having waited so long to have a change of heart, they offered to execute Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, an offer which Caesar refused. Caesar next wrote to the Senate, exploiting them to formally strip Marcus Aemilius Lepidus of his triumvirate and of all other public offices save that of Pontifex Maximus, which was a lifelong post. Although the role of Rome's high priest had been legally bequeathed to Caesar D. Filius by Julius Caesar and rightfully belonged to him, and despite the fact that Lepidus had acquired the office by underhanded means, Caesar D. V. Filius was not willing to break with tradition and risk offending Rome's father god, Jupiter Optimus Maximus. For this reason, he allowed Lepidus to retain the title of Pontifex Maximus. However, the official duties of the office were unofficially transferred to the son of the divine Julius Caesar, who then exiled Lepidus to the town of Circe. For victory over Sextus Pompeius, the reclaiming of Sicily, and for finally putting an end to the starvation of Italy, Marcus Vitsanius Agrippa was awarded the unprecedented Coroma Navalis, or naval crown. This was a laurel wreath made from golden leaves and decorated with miniature ship prows. The Senate also awarded Caesar D. V. Filius the Tribunitia Potasta, the sacrosanctity offered to Rome's tribunes of the plebs, an honor which Caesar connived to have extended to his wife, Livia Drusilla, as well as to his sister, Octavia Verena. Under the auspices of this legal sacrosanctity, Caesar, Livia, and Octavia became exempt from being named in any lawsuits, and their physical persons became legally unassailable. Deriving from the sacrosanctity which protected the actual physical structure of Rome's religious temples, the body which belonged to the son of the divine Julius Caesar now became inviolable, and his wife and sister, for the first time since the city was founded, enjoyed the same legal protections previously reserved only for women who served the state as Rome's vestal virgins. With Italy and the Western Roman Empire now secured under Caesar, and with Sextus Pompeius in full flight, it was time for the newly inviolate Caesar to fulfill his obligations to Marcus Antonius. Per the stipulations of the Treaty of Tarentum, 20,000 soldiers were owed to Antonius, who was preparing to invade Parthia. Caesar had already neglected to send Antonius the legions that had been stipulated in the Treaty of Brundisium. With the Roman Empire now equally split between him and Marcus Antonius, the question remained, would Caesar D. V. Filius keep his promise? This concludes Series 8 and the Second Triumvirate. Join us for Series 9 where we will examine the nuances of the growing conflict between Caesar and Livia in the West and Mark Antony and Cleopatra in the East. Thank you for watching.